Did you guys know there's a medication that is proven to treat migraines and prevent episodic migraines in adults? It's called Nurtec ODT, Remedjapan, 75 milligrams. If you suffer from migraine attacks, talk to your doctor to see if Nurtec ODT is right for you. Don't take if you're allergic to Nurtec ODT. The most common side effects were nausea, stomach pain, and indigestion. For important safety prescribing and patient information, visit nurtec.com. You made it. Here. Finally. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of that place you've always wanted to go. You know the one. It's nice. Even the kids like it. This place is so cool. And they never like it. Mom, can we go to the pool? Look at that. Not even asking for the Wi-Fi. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name is Stuart Wright, and today's guest is Richard Cabot. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I'm really looking forward to the whole experience. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. For the for the listener who can't see, I'm looking at a very sincere face right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also there's that there's that moment of like we've just spent about half an hour preambling and now I'm having to say hello and well and introduce myself again, which is always a bit weird, even for me, trust me. I um, I, I wasn't being ironic. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do five great punk films with you, and they're and and they're a great list, and we'll get on to them very soon. But uh okay. I mean I came I came to you because I saw write-ups about looking for a kiss. And then I found uh, right. a book you'd written, co- 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 co-edited and authored, uh, an anthology, Punk is Dead, or Dennis He Killed Every Night. And then there's a 2019 book, Dark Entries. And I think our mutual friend was Kathy Unsworth, wasn't it? I think that's a that's a, that's a connection between the two, two of us that, that helped me introduce myself to say, come on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know Kathy. Kathy's um, lovely, and she's uh, she's a cool writer uh, as well. And I heard the show that you did, and it was it was wonderful. And, and that's one of the things that is making me look forward to to this <laughs> total film experience. So, do you? Yeah. Want, I mean, as as a kind of qualifier, then thinking of those books and and your own your own sort of experience as a writer in the newspapers and magazines and stuff, you know, just give people a yeah. paint, paint, paint a picture of people as to your own experience of punk full stop, I suppose. I suppose my experience of punk is, is fairly typical. I, I, I come from a, a small suburban town um, called Dunstall, about 30 miles up to the M1. And um, so, uh, and I grew up, um, I was born in um, 1960 uh, and I grew up um in in the kind of seventies, did most of my growing up in in the seventies. Yeah, and uh, at that time in suburbia, um, the experience of uh, of youth, uh, including myself, uh, it was all about conformity. Uh, think things, you know, concepts like um, uh, you know, irony um, that they didn't exist. It, you, you had to conform. You you conform to to survive basically because if you you thought outside of uh, certain parameters, mm. then you you'd uh, you'd perhaps be you'd be up for a good kicking really. Uh, and it was a vi- very violent era. And uh, those parameters um, that I talked about, um, I suppose, were prescribed by um, you know, yeah, for instance, I. I went to uh, a grammar school, uh, which turned into a comp, and um, the whole issue, uh, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole purpose of that school really was to provide either people uh, to go on the production line, or if you were of the grammar school standard, mm. then you would you would work for the civil service. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted, but I didn't want any of that stuff. And there, there were there were people 
who um, had uh, perhaps um, been going out with each other, couples, they, they'd been going out with each other maybe for, for years at school, while they were at school. And, they, and, and I kind of look at them and they, you know, what are you doing tonight? And they, they were all, you know, going around Trevor's house and they'd go, they'd go around each other's houses and they'd sit in front of the TV together <laughs> and they wouldn't say anything to each other. And it was kind of like this preparation for, for being married. And I knew that I didn't certainly didn't want that, but I didn't know what I wanted. And I didn't know really what I wanted hmm. uh, until punk came along. And um, uh, what punk did, it, it, it kind of, it's, uh, overnight, all the all the former youth kingpins that had ruled the the roost in in terms of those kind of um, parameters I talked about, you know, where you'd go to the pub, you'd go to football, you'd have a fight, you'd go out with Nancy, and you'd go around her house and not say anything. Uh, all those people, the boot boys, and then you know, the slightly more the grammar schooly people who had the the prog rock rubbish. <laughs> You know, all of those former youth kingpins suddenly meant nothing. And not only did they mean nothing, they were laughable. And not only that, but they knew it somehow. They suddenly realised that that they didn't matter. They didn't matter anymore. And what punk did was they they put, they they helped to to formulate some things in, in your mind as culture does, I think, you know, film and music and books, etc. And so um, what pop punk did is it, it inspired you to, 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 to kind of, no, of course nobody, you know, we didn't know the people who had gone to punk what we wanted. But it was a question of ripping up. Mm. what had formerly been the rule book, throwing it up in the air, see where the pieces land. And punk was, it it was inspirational for one reason, really. And it it was a roadmap to a future. and 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 it did that by connecting a lot of wonderful things, such as, you know, clothes and sex and, you know, ideas and politics and art. And, and music, of course, because it had to be fun. So it was good to have things to jump up and down to. So that, that, that was my... Um, that out was out my of interest point. then, what was the kind of first touchstone for you then in that kind of, in that awakening, as it were, from... from in, ter- in terms of punk rock? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, was, what, was your first, what did you first come, come across, as it were, that sort of went, hold on a minute, this isn't, this isn't normal? Right, well, um, I guess the, the first... first exposure I would have had to to punk rock in its pure sense would have been um uh, there was a there was a little piece in a picture of um Sex Pistols at the Nashville in April uh 1976 yeah. and um it described a fight that the Sex Pistols had had uh, with members of of their own audience, and um, I kind of looked at this, and um, uh, you couldn't see Johnny Rotten's eyes; he was kind of looking away or down. Mm. But in my mind now, I, I have him and the look in his eyes and um, the spark. In, in his eyes um, and uh, that kind of spark spoke of, of of violence but it wasn't the kind of violence that I was uh, used to which is the, the violence I talk, uh, mentioned which was the football violence mm. and that uh, kind of fighting at school uh, you know the bullying even and uh, it was. Uh, it wasn't that at all. You couldn't. You could see in his eyes, which I didn't see, but which I saw. I got you. And it was. It was a different sort of violence, and it was a creative violence, and and it spoke of destruction. And I think, as he, as well actually as Malcolm said, you gotta you gotta destroy to create. And that was that was my um, 
that was my first exposure to punk in its pure sense. But before then, I mean, you know, I, I'd seen the year. Well, actually, no, that year, that year I had seen um, Dr. Feelgood mm. play. So I knew that something was going on uh, because they were, you know, they weren't your kind of everyday band, shall we say, that kind of yeah. plodded about the, the kind of circuit. They had a real electricity to them. So in terms of music, you know, the, 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 there had been that. For, for instance, the, the, the feel good thing and then the pistols thing uh, came along. And then I think in August of that year, the Hot Rods um, released a single, uh, well, it was EP, uh, Live at the Marquee, which was kind of a real, real intro for, for people, I think. Mm. To 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 punk. I mean, you know, nobody likes sitting in the hot rods these days, and they're considered as rubbish. And I think that if you spoke to, and I have spoken to people who were kind of in that, shall we say, the Cognoscenti at that time, uh, nobody liked the hot rods. You know, people like the one hundred one ers. But for me, uh, you know, suburban kid, everyday suburban kid, it was the kind of hot rods. And oh wow, you know. And then Anarchy came out, and I bought that the first first week. It was out, I think. Um, I think it's I think it's really interesting how 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 significant something like hearing music that doesn't sound like it's from somewhere anywhere else you've heard before from your kind of suburban enclave. I mean, I'm I, I'm sort of my experience was sort of ten years after yours in in a sense where I'm in a post industrial town ten year ten miles outside of Manchester, yeah. wondering is this it? <laughs> and then you hear you hear noises from outside of your comfort zone because obviously there was there was no internet then and you begin you, you begin to open your mind up to possibilities as to where culture might go beyond the stuff that you're given yeah no absolutely i mean it's it's a, it's a typical well ar- archetypal experience uh, as i think i said i mean you know we we all went through we all went through that mm. That kind of uh, birth, and uh, I mean, you know, what punk did is it's uh, it's for all of a sudden, it, all the people who who had felt as I did pre-punk um, as outsiders and who were perhaps bullied and who who felt different and it just couldn't fit in, you know, but didn't kind of want to express their boredom through typical means like drinking you know down the pub every night and holding Nancy's hand you know we found each other it was it was it was a kind of it was it was a place it was a location to 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 find other people who were like you you know and that was that was kind of important community community is important and I mean that I mean you know if people kind of say you know is punk dead well, no, it's not dead because punk, it, it was never a, it was never a simple youth cult. It wasn't, you know, mods or teddy boys where you kind of, you know, wore a pair of brothel creepers and then you settled down and got married and, you know, forgot all about that rubbish and perhaps played a rock and roll record every year to remind you of the youth. It wasn't that. It was, punk was punk was something different it it was as i i think as i said it it was different because it included a lot of things it included it included art ideas you know music sex bondage trousers tower blocks you know the the whole lot it just doesn't that you know there's we're still trying to work it out now this is yeah because i was just thinking i mean this is a bit fanciful so so by all means swerve it um could, could you imagine trying to explain to your 15, 16 year old self you'd still be talking about it 45 years later? <laughs> well, I knew that I'd still be talking about um, the, th- the kind of things that I was interested in. So, yeah, I, you know, I'm not going to kind of like stop talking about art or ideas or, yeah. you know, cre- cre- creativity. And, uh... but, but, but also, you were, you, you know, to be, be at the, be at the start of something that has been so influential. I mean, it, it, it's a reminder as well as to how young youth culture was, you know, 1977. We, I mean, Tony Wilson yeah. used to always, he had his fanciful idea that you had 
55, 66, 77, 88, you know, we were kind of almost like the the big moments in sort of certainly music yeah. culture. Well, that was, that was actually Caroline Coon because she, quite early on, she brought out the book called 1988. And okay. People, yeah, and she brought it out in 1977 and people kind of asked her, well, you know, why is, why is it called 1988? Because she said, she said, well, you know, that's when the next big youth cult is going to be because of the process you've just described. Wow, I didn't know. Right, you know, it was, it was kind of acid house, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, yeah, after yeah. That, that was That was kind of like the one, really, you know, if you kind of discount the sort of nostalgia stuff like mod, etc. you know, the next kind of real big, fresh sort of thing happening, you know. So it was kind of like, wow, yeah, okay. Well, it certainly um, was the last, so, the last new thing is you could call, you could yeah. honestly call new. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, yes, yeah, so uh, if Tony Wilson repeated that, uh, then they're both right, Tony and Caroline. So, <laughs> no, yeah, nice, yeah. it's nice to learn that. Now, what's going to be, what's interesting, and you, you said it quite a bit in what you were saying, is that punk wasn't just about, you know, music. It was it was more of a, it was it was more than that, wasn't it? And I think the five films that you've you've selected will enable you to sort of, convey a lot more about what punk is and not necessarily to say what punk isn't, but I suppose um, they, they, they aren't obvious in choices. I mean, one or two are, but certainly they're not all. And that's kind of what's going to be interesting about this discussion yeah. in, in the choices. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it describes the, the, the five films. Um, they, they describe an arc uh, that we'll, we'll kind of go into. Um, and, um, uh, 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 uh. I was going to talk about creativity, the the, the creative aspect of of, uh, of the punk experience, um, really. Um, so you have character arcs in films, and you have creative creative arcs, and I mean, certainly we'll be able to see that in these in these five films. But the the arc, as far as my my writing and creativity is concerned, yeah. Um, that that started definitely um, kind of with punk, really. I I started writing um, my own fanzine um, because it was a way of escape, you know. Music um, or creativity has always been a way of, uh, of of escaping your your, your surroundings in, in whatever way, and um, especially if you don't do things for kind of lust of result as it were if you do things for we were talking before for for the love of them and and they and if you do that often i find that um magically even though you haven't really thought about um you know well hey i'm going to do this fanzine because i know that it's going to get me a a top job in media Mm. you know even (laughs) you, you don't think that, but magically, and I think it is magic, and uh, it, it often happens. You know, it re- it works for you if if you know things start to happen. So in any case, I did. I, I started this fanzine in in, in Dunstable in um, in uh, Bedfordshire, and I started writing uh, writing about punk, and then. And then it kind of, re, you know, you start to meet people. You start, you know, you encounter other ideas. That you start talking to people, and and, and you you want to kind of move. And um, that's the process that writing that fanzine um, got me into. And it it got me uh, it got me into um, certain creative punk circles rather than other punk circles, which perhaps we'll go on to to describe or we'll talk about um, later in relation to to one of the films, mm. Jubilee. Um, but um, so, um, so I, yeah, no. And, and, well, I like, know, I like that. I like that notion of, of, of sort of the creative spark of it all, because I think a lot of youth movements, if they, if they get other people to go, well, what can I do? Like if I can't do that, what can I do? Then you know it's you know it's kind of working, don't you? Because people are wondering how they can contribute as opposed to just consume. Well, it used to be like the the, the thing, you know, in the in the ghetto, the only way out was through 
boxing or music mm. well in punk you know the way that you know it would get suburban kids out of the suburbs uh, was either through music or through writing fanzines that mm. was that that was they were the two two kind of things um so so i couldn't play guitar at the time and um i'm better now actually <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 all right now to tell you the truth but uh, in any case um yeah, writing was the thing, so I started that. And then and then what happened was it got to a certain point and you know you want to kind of you want to kind of move on really. And um I started writing um for the for the NME. Okay. In 1982 um I I wrote uh, I started writing for for the NME and I simply did it. I just simply sent a sent a, a live review off to uh, to the enemy because they weren't covering the bands that um, I I was going to see and um, they 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 were bands kind of new fresh young bands some of the, some of them were kind of um, from that sort of crass stable I think the first band that I sent stuff in on or that was published with maybe the Flux of Pink Indians do you remember them yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Was kind of nineteen eighty yeah it was nineteen eighty two and but then I started writing about a whole bunch of new new sort of punk bands which I then wrote a front cover piece on called Positive Punk which was about it was about it was about um the kind of colourful flash bands but I think we will talk about maybe talk about that again in relation to to one of the films uh, that we're going to talk about and that is um for Rocky Horror Show, I think. Um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. But it was, um, so, uh, that, it was exciting at the time, in 1982, punk, you know. I mean, punk, punk, punk went through its own kind of arc. Um, and, and, you know, it was great in 1977 and 78. It was like this, you know, it was kind of like the first sort of down a Monday in January. It was kind of, it was horrible. Lots of casualties happening. Really? Uh, yeah, 78, 79. But then by by the end of the, the decade, it, it, it again it was there was a resurgence. There were lots of lots of kids, you know. And it was, you know, some would say that punk was better then, you know. Um because before I mean, you know, punk was largely kind of isolated for most people. Not, when I say isolated, I mean people would be listening to the records and talking about them, going to gigs and all that kind of stuff. But by um, by the end of the seventies, eighties, it became it did become more of a community through through punk squatting, actually. Mm. You know, so mass punk squatting. I mean, there were kind of hundreds, thousands, maybe of um, of. Um, punk squatters in in london there there was lot, there was lots of housing stock and people had the will and the energy to 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 do that and to to kind of you you had um you, again you you had um well you had two two ends of it you had the kind of real sort of scuzzy punks who'd squat and maybe just take a lot of tune or and sniff a load the glue and be out of it all the time. But then, on the other hand, there was a real creative thrust to to. There's parallels, swing. isn't there, between London and New York in that sense, isn't there? And, and in that sort of time period when there was either affordable and or unused buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that's absolutely the case. I think New York definitely um, around or just after you had the you had the kind of. Um, you had the kind of no wave scene, mm. um, which was kind of inhabited by um, by a lot of uh, a lot of those people who who lived dirt cheap and who kind of lived their art and mm. crushing through that barrier between between life and art. Yeah. Well, should we should we get into the films then and uh, and and start to break up that that, that narrative arc then of, as you as you see it. Before we do, I will uh, give the listener who's not heard this font before a quick rundown of of what's going to happen. I've got five films listed. I will announce them each time we get to them. And when the dog barks at five minutes, we'll draw that one to a close and we'll move on to the the next one in the list. Uh, The only reason being is I'm too polite to tell you to stop talking. So the dog barking is my passive-aggressive 
reminder for the guest. And it also means that we spend equal amount of time sort of picking up the main points about each of the films you've selected because they are a great selection and they 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 well they straddle they straddle two decades. So that's that speaks to its own that speaks to its own ideas about of what you say is, is a narrative is, is an art, as it were, that Punk went on. And so every five minutes, the bell, the bell, the dog will bark, and I will start you off. The first one will go 1966, Chelsea Girls by Andy Warhol. First off, I'm going to tell, I haven't rewatched this film, and I haven't rewatched uh, any of the films. And we were talking a little bit before, weren't we, about mm. the actual kind of um, uh, the, the the way of thinking about films that you've seen, especially meaningful films that you've seen. And um, I kind of think that um, the the films and the the, the sort of uh, meaningful films again they they what they do is you don't just simply remember them they they kind of inhabit you mm. they they become part of you and and you know in a way you're kind of well not not living them you're not going to be Andy Warhol or anything like that but they you know they 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 are they are part of your your makeup and they implant a memory as I like to think it yeah, exactly. I mean, what 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 it is? I think with not kind of rewatching films, um, it, it it is like exactly like memory because what what you do is you you recontextualize in the same way that you recontextualize memories. So what 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 you have is that not perhaps this notion of that of reality of what really happened. You you have kind of like the true. I think the the the, the truth is it, is it actually what happened? Well, probably not. Is it the truth? Yes, it is because it's made up of everything that happened afterwards, uh, including everything that happened in your imagination. So, so what does Chelsea Girls for you? What does that spark for you first off? Then, where, where does that start in punk as, as a punk selection? Yeah. Okay. Well, Chelsea Girls. The shot at the Chelsea Hotel, largely, I think they did it in a kind of uh, other ho- other apartments as well. But most mostly, it's it's Chelsea girls, uh, the the Chelsea Hotel, and yeah, it was made in '66, and then it, I think it came out in in 1967. Of course, it was by Warhol and a guy called. Um, Paul Morrissey, um, who who some people like um, in context of Warhol, and, and some people don't like. And uh, I mean, the thing about um, Chelsea Girls, I mean, in terms of uh, of its style, is um, it lasts for three and a half hours, but it, it features a, a non-narrative structure uh, in which the characters are kind of extensively verbally physically assault one another um you know say horrible things and then just kind of really do nothing it's an, it's an experimental thing so what and because they wanted to kind of make it um a little bit more um commercial which is a laughable um idea if you've ever seen chelsea girls they they actually just, just a little into- bit laughable yes and they, what they did is that they put it into a split screen format, which means that there are two films happening uh, at the same time. So it's a good seven hour film in real. In, if you in you, real times, it is. It's it's <laughs> an uh, it's an absolutely fantastic. Um, it's a fantastic idea. And um, is it? Do you think, in a way, it's an idea of its time because? You know, we were we were in a me. I guess you would call it like a media, like certainly visual media poor era. So the idea of making a three and a half hour film of anything would wouldn't be seen as indulgent as it would be to this day, even though it would be indulgent back then. Yeah, I think he, I think he did it. I think he did it purely um, out of. Um, off the top of his head, I think mm. he made it up as he as he went along, and I think that um, I think that Paul Morrissey thought, well, we can't have a seven hour film, a seven and a half hour film. We're going to make it into into three and a half hours, um, basically because he wants to sell it. Paul Morrissey was the guy who wanted to to bring to bring Warhol out into into the world rather than have him kind of in some sort of small place in um, you know 
in a in a dingy club in in New York. Um, so what 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 uh, what you have is um, uh, you, you have uh, you have uh, you have these stars amongst them the the you know the the Warhol superstars Jeremy Langer Ingrid superstar Mary Boronoff International Velvet and, and of course Nico. Is that five minutes? Was that five minutes? You were worried that five minutes would last forever. That's five minutes, Richard. Wow, that's absolutely unbelievable. I've got I've got um, a whole book's worth of stuff to say about it. I've got to, I've got to up my game. I've got to up my speed. <laughs> well, look, that's that. Do you want to do you want to finish your thought? Do you want to finish your thoughts on that? Do you want to round your okay, thoughts off? Just, yeah, instead of whittling on about the actual kind of format, which is kind of which is which is part of it, because we can look at we can kind of define if you want to define punk films, you can define it in a couple of ways, and that's really in terms of punk tone and production values. Mm. And Chelsea Girls had all that, as well as the associations with um, with Andy Warhol, uh, who was important to important to punk rock. And um, it was his peon, really, to the 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 importance of of underground life, um, and the fabulousness of uh, of his own and underground life. Mm. So you had an array of these superstars, and it was it was really a way of demystifying the the, the superstar experience uh, as well. Um, Taking drugs, taking a load, a load of speed, and just being really nasty and being narcissistic and being in love with themselves, and in love with youth and in love with New York and in love with a forward, beautiful motion of their own lives, and in in love with boredom um, as well, because uh, the actual format reinforces that notion and tests that notion of boredom. You know, how long can I look at this bit before I flip to the other other screen, you know, on, on the screen, uh, which is fantastic. And all of those things, including that idea of the inner circle, the cognoscenti, all of it fed into punk rock in 1975 at Malcolm McLaren's shop and in 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 his head, and you can imagine Sid Vicious in this film, Chelsea Girls, which of course is kind of ironic because hey, that's where Sid Vicious ending up and and you know ended mm. up um, killing Nancy Sponge, and if he did it, um, and also I spent I, I went to. The Chelsea Hotel as well. I just thought I'd throw that in. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I lasted an hour with uh, Chelsea Girls. Uh, so yeah. I, I feel like I watched two <laughs> hours, obviously, because there was two screens going on. <laughs> but um, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to give it three and a half hours of my time. And it's, it's an impossible watch on a. I mean, I've got big monitors. I'm not on a laptop, but. It's an impossible watch when you sat at a computer. I can tell you that for nothing. You see, this is this is this is the thing. If you watch it on on uh, on a computer screen, um, it's it's a hard ask. Uh, well, I think I'm doing. But, I think you're just doing it wrong. To be honest with you, I think that's this not the way no, to see it. Well, no, I think it's kind of it is a bit because when you see films on a computer. Hmm. You've got that kind of freedom to walk away, make a cup of tea, come back, whatever. And we were talking about it's important the place where you actually see a film. Mm. And now I saw that film for the first time in a place in, in London called the Scala Cinema. Yeah. Where, I mean, it was a type of place that was exciting in terms of what was happening in the actual auditorium. As much as as much as what was happening on the screen, right. it was that kind of locus. It was kind of like the Roxy Club or the Vortex of the yeah, cinema. Yeah, yeah, I mean the Scala. It was, it was, yeah, it's, it was, it was infamous. A, it was a beautiful place. So it was kind of akin to watching it on a computer. In that. You'd never go to the Scala and watch a film, sit there and watch it kind of all the way through, staring, you know, raptly at the screen. You'd be doing other shit, like, you know, 
hanging out with people, going off, having sex in the toilets, watching other people have sex, watching people kind of shoot up. Well, you know, there was a cat that kind of wandered around on, on people's laps, which would be kind of like disturbing enough in itself at certain points, you know, depending on what kind of <laughs> mood you were in, if you know what I mean. Uh, so it was exactly that. You, nobody would ever go to see Chelsea Girls, watch it for three and a half hours solidly. You do other things, and then you come back into it. in. I don't feel so guilty. Right then, your second choice. You're going to jump as you're going to jump as nine years into the future, and we're on the brink of punk rock as you describe your discovery of it. But this is the 1975 film, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Do you want to talk about? Well, let's start with where did how did you first see Rocky Horror Show then? Well, I I. Uh, saw the Rocky Horror Picture Show actually um, uh, a long time after it had come out. Okay, but but I I had seen the original Rocky Horror Show stage performance oh, yeah. at down the King's Road in the in the mid seventies. It started off, I think, kind of early, 1973 maybe, uh, at the Royal Court Theatre, which is kind of on Sloan Street. But then it moved down uh, a bit later on to um, the classic uh, cinema, which, um, I mean, it probably doesn't exist anymore. It was the one that you kind of go down towards the world's end. Oh, right. and you And you, it was on the left. I mean, I haven't been down the King's Road for years, but I mean, I know they used to have gigs there at uh, uh, one time. I think Ian Dury, before before he even went solo, I played there with maybe Kilburn and Hiram. But in any case, that, that's where the Rocky Horror show was God. in the 70s. So um, as well, uh, uh, and it was kind of like the Rocky Horror, going to see the Rocky Horror show was kind of like a precursor, really, to to uh, to punk uh, for a variety of reasons. And I mean, this is kind of uh, a lot of those reasons are echoed in in the film, which is why I kind of um, why I kind of thought it was valid to to put the film in as well. And I mean, the film came out quite early as well, didn't it? It came out what seventy five? Yeah, yeah, seventy five. Yeah, so it's, it's it's there on the brink, and it. I can, I can. It, it, it seems like an it seems like an odd choice in terms of how I think of it, but actually, when you talk about the stage, the stage show being something that yeah, well, what the, I mean, I, I don't know if people have seen it or or, or or know about it very much. I mean, I presume that I presume that everybody knows about the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but it's but really it's about a, a couple whose car breaks down and they go to this castle and they encounter this guy, Doctor Frankenfurter, an apparently mad scientist who's actually an alien transvestite from the planet transsexual in the galaxy of Transylvania. Oh. Well, I mean, it's, it's fantastic for, for a number of, uh, of reasons. And I mean, getting back to, to the whole, uh, to the whole punk film, when it was on as a stage play yeah. in, in the seventies, Malcolm and Vivian would have, would have totally gone to see that that stage play, they they knew most of the uh, most of the people who were involved in that, and most of the people who were involved with that were part of a, a grouping in London that were kind of pre-punk um, called them. Did you ever hear about? No, I don't know. A group called them. Yeah, um, it was all. It was kind of full of glitzy young movers. So you had people like. Um, uh, artists um, such as uh, Buggy Fields, and you, and you had your um, sort of little Nels, who was actually in um, the the stage play and the film, the, the Rocky Horror Show, and you had Andrew Logan, whose whose oh. party the the Sex Pistols played at very uh, very early. And um, I mean, you know, you had kind of Malcolm and Vivian knocking at that kind of door and not really being let in. So punk, in a way, I, I think was probably a revenge 
on those people not to not to kind of you know be embraced by them as fully as they perhaps uh, or recognized by them as fully as they kind of um wanted to uh, wanted to be in a way um but in, in in terms of in terms of influence, I mean, everybody knows the the, the kind of clothes that um, that, for instance, that people uh, wore in um, in the in the in the film mm-hmm. and in the stage play, which is you know all kind of transist like gear and ripped fishnet stockings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, it's interesting because I kind of re- I remember. Um, Go on, finish your thought. Unbelievable. Uh, Patricia Quinn, an actress who played Magenta in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, is uh, she's adamant that the costume designer, Sue Blaine, who, who went on to be a real kind of star, actually invented punk. Uh, That's interesting. Because well, the aesthetic, because you mean the, the fashion aesthetic idea? Aesthetically, of yeah. Okay. And um, how 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 Vivian Malcolm really picked up on that. But again, I'm kind of misjudging five minutes. I think it's 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 horrible that timing, Stuart, five minutes. I think we need a lot more time. But hey, you know, we can always do a part two. But listen, I mean, for for for, for various for various reasons, I mean that the, the whole idea of the Rocky Horror Show, which deals with issues such as androgyny, it kind of denaturalizes gender, uh, it kind of talks about and to the, the the suburban experience which really interacted with glam which is also part of mm. um uh, the situation which then fed into punk via the banshees who had their own kind of um dark take on desire and you had the whole the whole kind of trash and funny aesthetic because the Rocky Horror Show really was a mishmash of horror and science fiction, but done in a fun way. The same as if you want to take it on that level. I mean, the Banshees took the dark side and ran with it, which is fantastic. Yeah. But you also had bands like the Dan. You made it. Here. Finally. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of that place you've always wanted to go. You know the one. It's nice. Even the kids like it. This place is so cool. And they never like it. Mom, can we go to the pool? Look at that. Not even asking for the Wi-Fi. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, guys. If you suffer from migraine attacks, you know they're horrible. And they can strike at any moment. Thankfully, there's Nurtec ODT, Remedjapant 75 milligrams. The first and only medication proven to treat migraines and prevent episodic migraines in adults. Take Nurtec ODT to get migraine pain relief in as little as 60 minutes and protection that can last for up to 48 hours. Or take one in anticipation of a migraine attack to avoid interruptions to your plans. Giving you time back to focus on the things you love doing, like going to concerts, spending time with family, and listening to music or podcasts like you're doing now. With over 1 million prescriptions written, this tiny tablet can make a big impact. Talk to your doctor to see if Nurtec ODT is right for you. Don't take if you're allergic to Nurtec ODT. The most common side effects were nausea, stomach pain, and indigestion. For important safety, prescribing, and patient information, visit nurtec.com. And who took that kind of trashy, fun level. And it was also, you know, it was, it was actually part of a whole kind of cachet of films that came out at, at that time which uh which, you, you had you had films um uh, like the night porter and you know which had that kind of you know chic to it, that kind of nazi chic if uh, if you like mm. and uh I was thinking when you were saying all your the description, damn, you know, the Visconti film was there. It was all the all the, you had all of that and the Rocky Horror Show all at the same time feeding feeding into, it. and you had you had um, yeah. I mean, perhaps we'll get uh, well. No, just think, just think as you were talking there about you know androgyny and 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 the like. You have you obviously had the New York Dolls were happening, and that was you know that that, that was clearly you know there's parallels there, isn't there, between what the Rocky Horror Show was doing as a stage production, and what and what Rocky, what the New York Dolls were doing as a as a band, you know. They, 
Uh, uh, absolutely. And the most important thing about um, uh, the Rocky Horror Show and the Rocky Horror Picture Show was the line from the film, if there was nothing else, it'd still be important. It was, don't dream it, be it. And that that's what punk absolutely essentially was in terms of sex, in terms of creativity, in terms of whatever you want it to do, don't dream it, be it. And that is something that, you know, when we talked about uh, something inhabiting you yeah. that lives in you, well, then if there's one thing that lives in you from for, from from punk rock, yeah. then that's it. Don't dream it, be it. No, that's, that's absolutely perfect. And it's sort of like if, if anyone was ever doubting why why you might pick it, then th- there there's the answer. Exactly, kids. It is totally. Don't dream it, be it. Yeah. No. So so it was it was a fabulous. A fabulous and inspirational and fun, fun, fun thing. Jumping a couple of years on to 1978, we've got Jubilee, Derek Jarman's sort of past, past, present, and future look at the world through through the through the I don't know punk rock nihilism. I don't know. <laughs> I I I said to you before we start recording, before you before I start the clock on you, I, I mean this is this is a film that really really stayed with me and I haven't rewatched it till getting prepared for this podcast. So I was lucky enough to see this on TV in in the early 80s when Derek Jarman films were on Channel 4, which as a young lad of like 12, 13, I had no idea what I was watching. I knew that I was transfixed and I knew that I wanted to understand it but didn't. But it didn't make me turn it off. It made me go, it obviously st- stayed with me all this time. And to be honest with you, in a way, I kind of wish I hadn't rewatched it because the the horror of it, as it were, is now lost because I can see there's a, there's an innocence to it now that that you know forty years later I can see, but but then I was it terrified me that this had been this had been made and, and I don't mean that in a kind of in a pejorative way I mean as in it stirred something in me that I hadn't been ready for, um, and that's kind of exciting with any kind of art. But do you want to tell us? Is 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 it too obvious to say? You know why? How why is this a punk film, or where does this fit into punk? Well, it's a it's 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 a punk film for many reasons. Um, uh, again, the production values and uh, but also the uh, the tone and and the meaning of it. It's a dystopian vision of a decayed, morally bankrupt Britain seen through the eyes of a time traveling Queen Elizabeth and. Um, it's all otherworldly, um, moving out of sync, non, non-linear, logical. It flows and it weaves and it jars and it's, it's all skewed vortexes and walls and it's uh, unsettling heat haze and it has Blakey and insight and it has, it has a poetry and it has a dissolution as well. And... Um, uh, my book, Looking for a Kiss, which I, I don't know if we're going to get a chance to talk about um, books and books that I've written later, but if if not, the one the one book that um, uh, of mine that uh, I think uh, is worth looking at for people out there is Looking for a Kiss, and one one of the the characters, a guy called Robert. Um, if I can just refer to this, it kind of explains a few things about it. I'll just read this piece, it won't take too long. Robert thought of Derek Jarman's film Jubilee, which he had seen several times for the Adam and the Ants footage, for the most the most truthful depiction of punk of any movie, and never mind Viv Westwood's nonsensical letter to Derek Jarman t-shirt. More recently, he'd realised the film's real significance lay in the John D. alchemy, aerial, time travel scenes and themes. These sparked in him the idea that life was an array of portents and visions for another future life. Obviously, no need for acid, this lad. It was an occult chemistry that inhabited the film's viewer in the same way as the film's first piece of music, Brian Eno's ghostly slow water from music for films, which rendered the rest of the soundtrack almost inaudible on a certain level. 
In this respect, it was magic because it made things disappear. Jubilee led Robert to think that even if there is a pattern and substance in this universe, this substance is meant to be hallucinatory and arcane. And if it is meant to be chaotic too, then it also contains a strange acumen which, like the scrying of John Dee and his like, no one ever really fathoms. Jarman has surpassed himself, thought Robert. Plus, he really liked Jordan's twin sets and pearls. That's, so that's a bit from, from my book, Looking for a Kiss, which I think kind of nails all, everything uh, that's brilliant about Jubilee, including really Jordan, uh, who uh, is an actress, and in, in the way that she um, possessed punk and that punk possessed her uh, from before punk even existed, uh, makes her the the first punk and, and the queen of punk and she she died very very recently yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, you know I think this this film uh, just even talking about uh, this film is uh, is a kind of uh, memorial to to her because she uh, really um, is is the is the is the touchstone in in the film the mainspring of the film, and um, she is she is the one that um, kind of um, projects the attitude uh, that that strikes or that struck uh, to British sensibility, and she is the one that in the uh, in the film. Uh, really um, carries forth the 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 meaning of punk, which uh, which actually which echoes um, the "Don't Dream It" bit, and I think that um, Jarman maybe even kind of uses that line, or if he or that Jordan uses that line, and if uh, if not, then it's um, then it's very close. I forget the actual line itself, but it, it basically it, it kind of reiterates the punk stance of "Don't uh, Don't Dream It, um, Be It." So, um, all 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 power to um, to Jordan, really. I mean, the the thing watching it with 2022 eyes is actually, as in addition to Jordan, you've got all these other female cast members who are leading the story. There is there's barely a male character in it who is who is leading the narrative. It's a really it's really progressive in that sense. The film again, it's like the Rocky Horror Show, which um, which really um, looked uh, and examined uh, um, in a couple of different ways gender. Uh, and again, um, Jubilee did uh, did exactly the same. And perhaps there's no no coincidence that that uh, Derek Jarman was part of that whole um, them um, wave uh, and with those with those sensibilities, so that you did you all the all the all the all the powerful um, roles, all the main roles were were actually uh, were actually women. Mm. Uh, you, you had Jordan, who we we talked about, and um, again, I, I just just to stress that Jordan was she was she was disorderly magic, pointing out beyond the lusterless to to a world where it's possible to discover kind of meaning and, and adventure. And you had the slits and all those people. But so uh, aside aside from aside from 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 the the, the kind of when the the, the women it was a prophetic film in 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 many ways mm. i mean it, it kind of it, it um it talked about and looked at a, a, a corporate future with, which kind of hadn't been imagined really mm. before uh, at that point you know it, Thatcherism hadn't hadn't happened mtv hadn't happened apart from in 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 this film and the other the other great role is is Orlando, who uh, who plays um, Gintz, who you know, who says they all sign up in 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 the end, 
And he also says if you if you turn up the sound, the volume, then you won't hear the world falling apart. Yes, and yes, he's that's damn true. well going to uh, to sell the sounds on on that. Um, uh, he also says, yeah, um, the other great line, uh, the other great inflection that that he has or reflection rather, he's saying that um, people are too busy looking at his crappy movies to notice what else is going on in, in the world. And it's, it's absolutely prophetic, um, which, of course, you have the prophecy of John Deere and you have the prophecy of the film itself. Yeah. And it's a magical film. It works in a, in a whole vortex and a whirl of, of meanings. And, uh, I'm not, yeah, I think you can kind of, again, you can watch it again and again if you, if, if you like. But um, that that whole idea of being inhabited by a, by a film it definitely it's definitely film. felt like it was it was made in the right in the middle of punk happening. You know, it, its energy is undeniable. I think it is, and it's that uh, they it's, sometimes it has a really bad energy, and um, that bad energy I, I, I'm afraid was part of punk, and it was part of um, part of the kind of scene. Um, going on at, at the time that we kind of touched on before and we won't be able to go into it too much but there was some bad things happening and some bad squats out out there mm. some real end of the world things going on believe me and okay. um and jubilee caught it they it caught that that bad vibe mood happening as well but it also caught the as i said the poetry uh, as as well hats off to Derek and Jordan. Now, this this the the fourth choice is is arguably the, the a sort of a quintessential punk rock film because of who who the subject of the film is, and and uh, this is 1980s the Great Rock and Roll Swindle. So the reason for the Great Rock and Roll Swindle being a um, fantastic film. Well, I mean, it's, it's Steve Jones plays a detective uncovering the truth about punk. Um, but really, it's um, and uh, he, he, what he's trying to do is he's trying to uncover how Malcolm McLaren manipulated the band to the the, the, the top of the music biz, and really the power and the glory I, I think of the great rock and roll swindle and its uh, its importance lies simply in Malcolm McLaren. I, I, I think that. Um, I think that if we're going to talk about um, people, I know that people will disagree. And um, well, hey, that's the the glory of culture. But I mean, it, the but Malcolm McLaren is is the, the 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 kind of outstanding thinker, the outstanding personality, remaining uh, personality in in punk rock. Well, when I say remaining, obviously he's not alive, but you know, in culture. Um, of, of of punk rock and um, the the reason for for this in the great rock and roll swindle um, you, you can talk about a lot of things but I, I guess the the the, um, the 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 main thing uh, that uh, we can take from from it uh, sound like uh, it sounds like a lecture really but it isn't really his his idea and i think it's a great idea is that music the ideas themselves are always more important than the music and i think that one of one of the lines in it said you know if people bought the records um for the music this scene would have died a, a long long time ago and it's absolutely true. You didn't you didn't buy Anarchy in the UK because it was a great decision. You know, of course, it's brilliant. You know, it's mm. fantastic. But there, there was all the other associations. But you kind of fed into uh, unwittingly and unknowingly. And also, he so he that it's also the same same with the film. Uh, I think, and um, and I think that Malcolm rightly. Is uh, is the catalyst, and he's the one that um, made punk uh, ignite. And um, uh, in terms of you know popular culture, and and he did this through through his belief in 
uh, in in the in the ideas associated with punk and the great kind of slogans that came out like you know the believe in the ruins and it, anyone can be a sex pistol which is a, which is a, which is a fantastic idea which goes back again to the kind of demystification of the, of the superstar ethos from from Andy Warhol where you you get some kind of junkie as as a, as a superstar and and kind of being built up as such and again it's that idea that anyone can do it you can do it you can you can go out and, and do it and that was that 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 was that was the overriding idea of punk because that is exactly the same, has exactly the same meaning as Don't Dream It Be It. All, the, all these films have. And Malcolm was, was the one who really realised this and he, and he put it forward. And although, yes, he kind of jokingly portrays himself as the, the trickster um, as the person who swindled um, the, the the music biz for his own personal gratification or, or his own fun, I think that it actually he was a, he was a very idealistic person who wanted to see revolution, uh, revolution in kind of every sense, and and um, I think he was right to use all the Sex Pistols money in making uh, making this film. And uh, I think the only tragedy really is that it was kind of taken away from him at the end by Julian Temple. But, you know, too late for Julian Temple to fuck it up completely. And, um, I mean, you know, yeah, Julian Temple's all right, but he's not Malcolm McLaren. He's, he's Malcolm McLaren's a genius. Julian Temple, you know, he's, he's all right, you know. But that filth and the fury film that he did as it was a... Uh, you know, it, it was just uh, you know, it, it was just a kind of collection of um, you know music bits and Johnny Rotten pretending to cry over Sid Vicious. It was, it was, you know, it was all right, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't this. It wasn't. Well, I guess, I guess the difference, I guess the difference is, you know, at first the Great Rock and Roll Swindle, I guess when it's first released, is like a postscript on punk, isn't it? Because if 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 Sucks Pistols yeah. were were the post kind of I mean well I think I think actually what it did is it kind of reintroduced punk into into popular culture because when it been like by 1980 I mean punk wasn't kind of happening really it kind of largely gone I think it kind of reignited um, people's interest a lot and oh, I mean, no, no, I'm sure know, I'm sure it did in that sense but in terms of the sex pistols being poster boys for what for the punk explosion they'd already yeah. finished hadn't they so the idea of a film yeah about yeah them, was, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And anyone can be a six pistol, and the band don't matter. What 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 actually what was important was the ideas, and I mean the ideas. It was the, the again, it goes back to that, that idea of boredom and emptiness that we kind of see in 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 Warhol, and and we see Malcolm, who whose way of of combating that emptiness and boredom, kind of. It was inspired by you know his interest in situationism, which you which is where you had the so-called spectacle, mm. which is a construct of boredom and uh, emptiness. And um, I mean, Malcolm took that situationist idea of um, using you know improvisation and transitory kind of situations, as you like. Uh, to to combat that, so you you know, and and, and, a, and a situation could be anything from some kind of psychogeographic drift in, or a political prank, and or a film. And this was it. This was this was Malcolm. This was Malcolm's way of uh, of attacking the, spe- the the spectacle. And it was it was a, it was a it was a situationist manoeuvre and it was actually absolutely fantastic do you not think though there's a chicken and egg though about punk in a sense sort of obviously there's the chicken and egg that says there is no sex pistols without malcolm mclaren and there is no malcolm then the other way around goes there is no malcolm mclaren without the sex pistols i think he'd have done it in in some some other way really well, it wouldn't have been punk, but it would have been it would have been something. It would have been, yeah, maybe through I don't know film, clothes, yeah. whatever. You know, talking we're talking about kind of ideas and 
uh, how magically they kind of, um, if you do what you love and you do what you believe, yeah. you know, how, how magically they're kind of, you know, transformed into something. And I mean, you know, would it have mattered if the sex pistols hadn't existed? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, the, uh, there's loads to talk about in this. There's a whole idea of play power and how, how things, you know, don't be an adult, you know. But, mm. Too too much to talk about now. Let's do a part two. <laughs> <laughs> well, look the, uh, the but, yes, but the rock and roll swindle, uh, you know, fa- fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. I film. think it gets. I think it it gets better with age. The further it gets away from 1980, the more it become becomes a document of its time, and less and less about where punk yeah, was in 1980. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, th- I think that. It, it kind of lives and dies with Malcolm. And I mean, people kind of go through these periods of either hating him or, or kind of loving him. I mean, you know, he hasn't really got a great name, uh, uh, I guess, at the moment. Um, but there have been periods when he has had a great name. And um, uh, well, does, he, does, The film doesn't help his, help any accusations of exploitation that were put to him, you know, in terms of his own benefit. Well, no, or because I mean... Yeah, no, but I mean, it's funny because, I mean, you can actually kind of, you know, that whole idea of the trickster that he actually promotes. Mm. I mean, you know, you can, even that's a trick, really, because I think the thing about Malcolm McCarran was that he, he, he trod that kind of fine line between, you know, wanting, uh, pure rebellion and wanting to, to be accepted. Mm. Uh, and and that's what kind that that's what kind of put punk um or well, his ideas and punk on on that on the on the on the level which brought it to people like me. Um, and it's the same. I'm gonna say in a nutshell there, you've kind of nailed a lot of things. Everybody's an out everyone could be an outsider, they follow the path of what they love, that becomes more popular. And then when you try and move on to the inside, you don't fit. So you end, up, yeah. you, know, you end up being repelled by the thing that got you going in the first yeah, place. Yeah, well, everything everything has its kind of arc, doesn't it? Indeed. Well, look, going, we're going to complete the arc now, and we're going to jump beyond punk, as it were, as, as, a, as a period of time when it was instigated, to real post-punk. And, and this was a real surprise to me, and it was a real pleasure to go back and watch this ahead of the, ahead of the podcast. I'm talking about 1987's with Nail and I, which obviously is set in 1969, so it's kind of it's all over the place in terms of punk's narrative. So, where where for you does does this sit as a as a piece of punk art, a punk you know a punk film? Well, I think it's it's an ending film. It's the the film is actually full of endings, and I mean um, uh, every every arc, and we're we're talking about. Uh, the arc of punk at the moment has mm. its has its beginning and ending. That's not to say that after um, an ending arc there aren't other arcs, but but this is its own own one in in this context. So you know, uh, with an eye is is uh, is 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 a sixties film. It's kind of set as well. It is set in the sixties, and, and it was released in nineteen eighty. Seven, I think it was yeah. something like that, and um, it's a sixties film because you have those kind of characters like you know Danny, who was the the the, the drug dealer, and um, uh, you still had those kind of characters in in punk. Actually, I mean, people like kind of Danny who. They didn't kind of go away. They kind of stumbled from one street corner to the next street corner, and that next street corner in Ladbroke Grove was was kind of punk rock. They were they were kind of around, you know, that sort of biker. Who will buy my you. speed? Anyone will buy my speed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know, and the music was sixties, but really it was kind of as much a, a, of a, of an eighties film uh, as it as it as it was a sixties film because. It dealt with a couple of things. One, which was the the, the, the commodification of um, culture, countercultural ideals, mm. which you you know they're selling hippie wigs in Woolworths, man. I've forgotten that's where that line come from till my recent rewatch, because like I, I knew that line more than I knew the film. 
So it deals with that and the kind of malignant effects of, of the, I suppose, the ide- ideology that t- took their place, which is naturalism and, you know, corporate culture, uh, which Jubilee also also dealt with in, in a different way. Mm. And what with Nail and I did was they dealt with it in an extraordinarily funny, yet poignant way. Um, and it's it's a... It's a it has that kind of post-war kitchen sink sense of kind of hopelessness, and, and to anybody who's um, who's kind of ever ever squatted, it kind of makes complete sense. These characters just kind of, you know, not not even squat; they just you know been young and come to an end of a of a period, and you have that kind of existential melancholy where. It's all coming to an end. It's it's all it's all over, really. And um, these are these are really people who don't really know what to do next. And if you were uh, of a, a certain age in 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 the mid to late eighties, and you had invested a lot of uh, time and energy into uh, something called punk rock. And um, and 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 your own kind of personal self in into 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 that ideal. Then by nineteen eighty seven, believe me, you 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 had come to realise that um, well, hey, actually, the, there was uh, there's nothing nothing kind of left and. Um, the road, the road map had run out at it at that point. Then <laughs> the road map had run out, and this is largely what "Looking for a Kiss," the the book that my book that I mentioned before is is about. It's about a, a couple of people who have invested all their energy into an ideal, who have uh, and into the, the themselves as a, as a as a couple, and who have uh, reached uh, reached the end. And um, they perhaps uh, do not know, or I think one of them actually does not know, um, and perhaps still doesn't know, um, really, what on earth to uh, to do next. And I and I talk about this, and I write about these characters. They go and uh, they go and see the uh, the, the, the film, and um, to read a little bit out of it. Go on. Uh, out of the the book might explain something uh, about why this film is important and put it into context. A little while in the future, he could see both of them, that is both he, Robert, and his girlfriend, Marlene, on the bus up Haverstock Hill to the Hampstead Classic, where they watched With Nail and I. This film had a big impact um, on both Robert and Marlene. The journey back was made in silence, The atmosphere, one of suspicion. They gave each other the odd penetrative look, jealousy. Both of them identified with with Nail, the unreconstructed, hopeless boozer and loser. Marlene was something of a professional punk, while at the same time working shit jobs for speed and booze money. The house and co-op rent was nothing, food, fuck all. They lived on lentils. Uh, However, Marlene had got the wrong idea about punk from the start. Punk was, in effect, a way of stopping your past from becoming your future. But from 1976 onwards, Marlene was trapped in that punk moment like a fly in piss-coloured amber. No wriggle room forever. Punk had not freed her. She was instead imprisoned by the character she had assumed at that time. Just like her hero, Johnny Rotten, who seemed to have or portray only one emotion over the course of his whole career in life, anger, bad energy forever. Marlene's life was not underpinned by momentum, but by nostalgia. Marlene fucking hated Robert. In the film, he was I and was going to escape the squalor and the waste and embark on a career. He was going to fucking fulfil himself. She was meant to be the star, stardom, stardom, stardom. She craved it, she could see it, she could almost taste it. That film tonight Marlene came out with, you are I and I am with now. I am I? I and I 
Marlene misheard, wondering for a second why, why Robert was using the Rasta phrase. What? No, I am not. I am with Nail, he insisted. You are I. A compromise was reached. We are I, Robert said. You and I are I. You mean we are with Nail, Marlene corrected. With Nail and we. And it was uh, the story is all about trying to to find something else. And famously in uh, in, in the film, it is I who finds a way out, and uh, with now who perhaps uh, perhaps doesn't. And uh, so that's why With Now is uh, is a punk film. It, it works on it works on a personal level, and it works on a wider um ideological uh, framework really and um and it's superb now, and also the way the way you what you're describing there with your characters I, I i saw echoes of that when when acid house had fallen you know it stopped being what it was and became le- everything became legal and and it became more mass and it was not what it was and and then everybody talked about that there was nostalgia for something within 3 years of it happening and it and it was really interesting because they knew they'd lost something that they, at the time when it was happening, it felt fantastic and it felt like it could last forever, but then it slowly yeah. but surely disintegrated. And I think, yeah. I guess the reflection there was that I'd already we'd already experienced that <clears throat> with the explosion of punk culture. And then as as people drift away from it, the the the, the, the foundations of it are not are not was what they were, I suppose. Well, it's, it goes back to what we were saying about um, punk and that it, it wasn't it wasn't a youth movement as such it wasn't it wasn't that uh, because it had too much in it and it's still got too much in it you can call it punk you can call it something else um uh, so uh it, it's not as simple as that for, for people like marlene and robert because you know on one level they really understood that but on another level they had to live there to survive you have to eat and you are always always pressured by you know um the outside world and peers who are doing other stuff doing well i think the thing about arcs and beginnings and endings it's the same thing with um with scripts with film scripts and as a script writer i'm sure that you know yourself that every you break film scripts down into 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 acts mm. and you break it down further and you break it down really into that kind of step outline uh, format and and you know what i mean you know yes you have an arc but every little bit of a of a film and by that i mean every little bit of a life has its own arc so there isn't just one arc there's loads of arcs mm. and then you have an overriding arc and that's what makes uh, that's what makes it all doable do you know what that really you know that chimes with i recently i recently did a podcast with a guy who's written a book on screenwriting called beyond the it was called beyond the hero's journey which was this you know the hero's journey was this notion that that that, ar- that arcs were about one person's story and the argument here was all stories about character arcs whether it be the long one or the short one, that, that they're all, all characters are having some form of an arc or another. Or if they're not, the world outside them is changing and they're not, which is that where you get that resistance and frustration that what I've chosen to do is now out of step. Absolutely right. And if if the, if the arc, if, if, if they don't change, if there isn't an arc in every little bit, then the film's boring. That's mm. what makes films, books boring because you don't have that. It's very flat. And it's the same with lives. People people get bored because they're not changing. They're not, you know, they, they've kind of abandoned their arc. And it goes back to it goes back to that whole magical kind of ideal of an arc being a kind of same as an orbit. And uh you know, you have that idea of, and again, this goes back to the kind of star system that kind of link it up where every man and woman is a star. And it doesn't mean, you know, I know it's an Alistair Crowley quote. It doesn't mean that everyone is a kind of like celebrity. What it means is everyone finds their own orbit. And, you know, what you're meant to be, you find yourself and you're on that orbit and that orbit <laughs> It is hey, it's an arc. So no, I, I, mean, well, I agree because you get that because um, you have you have the notion of you have the energy when you're young, and then you maybe do end up getting trapped. Is maybe too strong a word, but you get into a rhythm which is 
you you earn, you pay mortgages or rent or whatever it might be. And there's a sense yeah. of progression that's not on your terms. And then you might reach a ripe old age and you've had, you then can make choices again. So you had choices when you were young and then very few choices because of the pressure, the external yeah. pressures of life. Yeah, and then yeah, suddenly yeah. people start rebelling against being a bit older. And it's like suddenly it, you, you've got the same, you're feeling like the same freedoms you had when you were 20. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing about our endings, this is always another beginning, and then that's 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 the that's the, the glory of it all, you know. Yeah, there's if you if you get a chance to see it, there's a film called Knives and Skin by a director called Jennifer Reader, and in her film, she has three coming of ages. So she has the usual one, which is the teenage girl, then she has the mother having a, her own coming of age, and then she has the grandmother having come of age, or like three generations of women within one film having their current coming of age what's it, what's it called again? it's called Knives and Skin it's a really uh, really interesting film on that front but let me run down the five films you've chosen to remind the audience as to the five great punk films we've discussed 1966's Chelsea Girls by Andy Warhol 1975's The Rocky Horror Picture Show directed by Jim Sharman 1978's Jubilee directed by Jarek Jarman 1980's The Great Rock and Roll Swindle directed by Julian Temple but as we've established very much made by Malcolm McLaren. Uh, 1987 with Nell and I, by, written and directed by Bruce Robinson. Um, they are, I, I think, I think from what you've talked about and, and with the ex- help of the excerpts on your book, I think you've, you've explained brilliantly why you've chosen the ones you've done, you know, outside of like Jubilee and Great Rock and Roll Sun being like obvious because of their direct punk links and, and the time they were made. But uh, I think, I think between them and, uh, and also, if you th- when you t- when you talk about your narrative arcs, I suppose you know Andy Warhol to Michael McLaren is like passing a baton on, isn't it? In some senses, yeah, oh, absolutely. yeah, totally and absolutely. And uh, and I th- uh, the, I chose them all because uh, again, they, they all they all feed in and inform um, my book, Looking for a Kiss. And can I say two lines about that? Oh, I just wanted to to say that looking for a kiss is it's 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 set in post punk London and New York, and it's a, a fabulous chronicle of speed, madness, and flying saucers. That's a Warhol, Edie Sedgwick reference, and it's it's acid pop art, teenage perversity, breakdown, break up, break out, the nature of melancholy, the spectacle, bathroom functions, clairvoyance, personality crises. Primal scenes, screams, schemes, the eternal quest for cool and the endless search for redemption and more. <laughs> and uh, and it was um, it was described by a, well one person, a writer for the International Times, as a Jarman-esque journey in Vivian Westwood Hills to Love Shrine, and and by someone else as a bittersweet Coltrane solo crashing into Einstein's and now Barton and by someone else as a drug fuel beat punk love hate story like Kerouac shot through with sadness not just the come down but the inability to bridge the gulf between enlightened moment of beatitude and the bleak surroundings you exist in the rest of the time uh, but it's also quite sort of funny and perky as well. And the, the having gone through this conversation with you, then the obvious, the final last question then is like, how did you find sort of weaving fiction into the sort of the facts of punk, as it were, that you're drawing on? Well, I mean, you know, I've been asked this before. It's kind of did you base it on your own life? And mm. my my answer always is it go it goes back to what we were talking about before which which was you know uh, is it exactly what happened is is that what happened well no not really but is it the truth yes it's the truth mm. absolutely and that i think that's what i think that's what real fiction is um actually um so 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 there <laughs> I, I concur I concur well it just gives me to say thank you very much for giving your time on the Britflix podcast well well thank you and I'm um, sorry for running over the uh, the time of the, the barking dog it was wonderful it was wonderful fun talking to you Stuart it really was and I, and I hope that people find some interest in it um, somewhere along the line
This is Sarah's O'Reilly Auto Parts story. Driving cross country with two young children is ambitious, to say the least. Then our check engine light came on. We pulled into O'Reilly Auto Parts and they tested it. Turned out it was a faulty sensor. They referred us to a great mechanic just down the street and we were back on the road in no time. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Hey guys, if you suffer from migraine attacks, you know they're horrible and they can strike at any moment. Thankfully, there's Nurtec ODT, Remedjapant 75 milligrams the first and only medication proven to treat migraines and prevent episodic migraines in adults. Take Nurtec ODT to get migraine pain relief in as little as 60 minutes and protection that can last for up to 48 hours. Or take one in anticipation of a migraine attack to avoid interruptions to your plans, giving you time back to focus on the things you love doing, like going to concerts, spending time with family, and listening to music or podcasts like you're doing now. With over 1 million prescriptions written, this tiny tablet can make a big impact. Talk to your doctor to see if Nurtec ODT is right for you. Don't take if you're allergic to Nurtec ODT. The most common side effects were nausea, stomach pain, and indigestion. For important safety, prescribing, and patient information, visit nurtec.com.